Welcome all, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Protecting Our Children and Youth from COVID-19, Information for Parents, Caregivers, and Community Partners. I am Rosalind Holiday moore Deputy Director for Programs with the Office of Minority Health at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and your webinar moderator. Before we begin, please be advised that the findings, opinions, and conclusions from this webinar are those of the speakers and presenters and do not necessarily represent the official position of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, also referred to as HHS, or the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC. CDC does not endorse any one organization, service, or product, and no such endorsement should be implied. Now for a few points about today's webinar. Reasonable accommodation is provided through closed captioning in English and Spanish. If you need these services, please click the link in the chat box. We will also post the link in the chat throughout the webinar. Spanish and Kamar interpretation will be accessed by clicking the interpretation button located at the bottom right of your screen. Make sure to select Listen in Spanish or Listen in Kamai, which connects you with an interpreter. Our panelists will now repeat these translation instructions in Spanish and Kamai for our guests. Lisa. Los subtítulos para el seminario web de hoy están disponibles en español. Si necesita estos servicios, haga clic en el enlace en el cuadro de chat. También publicaremos el enlace en el chat durante el seminario web. Som chum riep suot da lok lasai nen ke nya bang paun tang ah dai kampung chou ruom nei prapon a prom tam ra yak computer ni ke tha miet tho chuon chi ka bo prae tam ra yak phia sa khmae phia sa spanish ba san chi bang paun tang ah khnie dai kwat chou ruom sarap phia sa spanish ke mien dam no phot nei khnong prapon chat dam bai chach teu dam bai mue ka bo prae tam ra yak a so Sam rap bong ong tang ok nee dai chou ruom hai chong sdap ka bok prae nu som an chuing mu kang sdap dai nu nai mien sanya pan dai mien pia tha interpretation hai som chuek nu le sanya pan dai nu hai chuer le yok pia sa khmae luk nee nu de tuo bang ka bok prae chi pia sa khmae som ok nu. Zoom features available during the webinar include the Q&A, which stands for questions and answers, box located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can type and submit your questions throughout the webinar in the Q&A box. If you have a specific question for any presenter, please include that speaker's first name before your questions. Please note that we will not be able to answer all questions today. We will, however, post answers to questions not answered during the webinar on the webinar webpage. Please check this page regularly over the coming week. A link to the webinar webpage is in the is now in the chat box. Zoom poll questions will also be launched throughout today's webinar. Four questions will be asked to help us learn more about you. Participation is voluntary, and we welcome your feedback. Today's webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be posted on the webinar webpage in the coming weeks. Please check back regularly. Today's agenda includes opening remarks, two panels, panel one, be a superhero, learn and act on COVID-19 vaccination for children and youth, panel two, community superheroes working to protect children and youth from COVID-19, then closing remarks. We're now moving to opening remarks from Rear Admiral Felicia Collins, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Minority Health and the Director of the HHS Office of Minority Health, where she leads the office in its mission of improving the health of racial and ethnic minority populations. Although Rear Admiral Collins could not join us in person today, she recorded this video to share with you. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's event. It is my pleasure to join colleagues from across the Department of Health and Human Services, including our co-hosts, 
the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and esteemed community partners and pediatric experts. I am Dr. Felicia Collins, and I have the honor of serving as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Minority Health within the Department of Health and Human Services and the Director of the Department's Office of Minority Health. The Office of Minority Health is focused on helping to reduce differences in health outcomes or health disparities for racial and ethnic minority and American Indian and Alaska Native communities. On a more personal level, I describe myself as a pediatrician by training and a public health practitioner at heart. I have focused my career on addressing health disparities experienced by racial and ethnic minorities, children, and other underserved and vulnerable populations. Thus, I really appreciate this opportunity to help spread the message of the importance of COVID-19 vaccination for all children, including our youngest. Today's webinar is part of the efforts that stem from the Biden-Harris Executive Order 13995, in which federal agencies are working together to address the uneven and severe impact of COVID-19 in the nation's underserved populations. Today, you'll hear accurate information about how to protect all children from COVID-19. I am so pleased that everyone ages six months and older can now get vaccinated against COVID-19. And everyone ages five years and older can get a booster if eligible. Getting vaccinated against COVID-19 is a key step in protecting our children and youth from getting very sick or dying from COVID-19. During today's webinar, you will hear from speakers that include pediatric and vaccine experts and community partners leading vaccine efforts for children and youth. They will share with you the CDC's recommendations for COVID-19 vaccination for everyone ages six months and older, including where to find resources and credible information on vaccine safety. They will also share information on the risks benefits and myths associated with COVID-19 vaccinations for children and youth. They will have recommendations on what to ask a health provider about COVID-19 vaccination if your child has a disability. And you will hear how community partners are working to protect youth and children with disabilities and Black, Latino, American Indian, and Alaska Native, Asian American, and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander children and youth who live in communities disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. I want to encourage each of you to share the information shared today in your communities. Getting the free COVID-19 vaccination will help our children and everyone in our circle. Thanks again to each of you for joining us and enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Rear Admiral Collins. Now for our first poll of today. Please use your computer, cell phone, or other device to tell us what region in the U.S. best describes where you live. Those are rapid responses coming in. We have 30 seconds for this time. So please take a moment, let us know. It's almost like a race, seeing which region has the most representation, but I can tell you it's very impressive. Well, we're about at time. And so let's see, what have we learned about you? We have 25% of the audience from the Midwest, 26% of the audience from the Northeast, 29% of the audience from the Southeast, 8% from the Southwest, and 12% from the West. Thank you so much for your, your time and, and um, sharing that information. And now we move to the next slide as we begin discussion for our first panel. It will be moderated by Captain Anitra Johnson, an expert at the national level for policy planning at the Administration for Children and Families. Thank you, Ms. Moore. 
Our first panel, Be a Superhero, Learn and Act on COVID-19 Vaccinations for Children and Youth, will cover the impact of COVID-19 on children and youth, including vaccination recommendations, how you can access COVID-19 vaccines in your community, and how you use vsafe.cdc.gov, a smartphone-based tool that checks in on you and your child after receiving a COVID-19 vaccination. The second portion of the panel will explore COVID-19 risk implications by race, ethnicity, and disability. Parents and caregivers will also learn strategies for vaccinating children and youth with disabilities and resources for all children, youth, and young adults impacted by COVID-19. Next slide. Our first presentation comes from Commander Kevin Chatham-Stevens. Dr. Chatham Stevens is a medical epidemiologist and pediatric preparedness expert at CDC and currently serves on CDC's COVID-19 response as the pediatric vaccine planning and implementation lead. Dr. Steven, Dr. Chatham Stevens, I will hand it over to you. Great, good afternoon and thanks so much for the opportunity uh, to chat with you all today. As mentioned, I'm a pediatrician at CDC, but I'm also a father of two kiddos, both of whom who have received their COVID-19 vaccines and boosters. Next slide, please. So I'll start off by describing the tragic toll that COVID has had on children. It's really important to understand this toll to help reinforce the importance of protecting children through these vaccines. Some of the direct impacts of COVID on children include that children can get COVID-19, spread it to others and become seriously ill. And unfortunately, there's no way to tell in advance if a child will get a mild case or a severe case. Since the pand pandemic began, more than 13 million children have been diagnosed with COVID, two and a half million of them under five years of age. In addition, there have been over 65,000 hospitalizations and tragically over 800 deaths in children. And future surges will continue to impact children with unvaccinated children remaining at higher risk of severe outcomes. And some of the indirect impacts of COVID on children include missed opportunities for sports, play dates, or other activities that can further contribute to worsening of mental or emotional health, decreased school or daycare attendance, which can lead to widening of existing educational gaps, and decreases in routine childhood vaccinations. Next slide, please. Fortunately, we now have a safe and effective COVID-19 vaccine available for all children ages six months of age and older. These vaccines provide a critical opportunity to prevent severe illness, especially among those disproportionately impacted by COVID, including those from certain racial and ethnic minority groups and children with underlying medical conditions, disabilities, or special healthcare needs. Children get an age-appropriate smaller dose with each of these vaccines compared to doses given to older children. And the doses is based on the age of the child on the day of vaccination. For our younger children, the Moderna vaccine is for children six months through five years old and is a two-dose series. And the Pfizer vaccine is for children six months through four years old and is a three-dose series. We have a variety of vaccine resources on the CDC webpage, including information for children who have a weakened immune system. Next slide, please. Our goal is to ensure that all children have access to the vaccines. Similar to the vaccine program for children five to 11 years old, we're working to ensure vaccine for children under five years old is widely available in different locations throughout communities, really trying to meet children and families where they are as much as possible. However, there will be some key differences between this vaccine program and the vaccine program for children five to 11 years old. For example, about one third of five to 11 year olds were vaccinated in pharmacies. We anticipate most children under five years old will be vaccinated in their primary care clinic. So pediatricians, family practice doctors, and nurses in local health departments, especially in rural areas, Indian Health Service and tribal health clinics, and federally qualified health centers and rural health clinics will continue to serve critical roles in contributing to vaccine equity. We do still anticipate that pharmacies will play a critical role, for example, in having vaccine available at nights, on weekends, and on holidays when clinics may be closed. We encourage parents and caregivers to reach out to their child's pediatrician or family practice doctor, their local health department, and local pharmacy to ask if they have the COVID-19 vaccines. 
Parents can also check vaccines.gov to search for nearby providers offering the vaccine. In addition to the doctors, nurses, pharmacists, and others who will be vaccinating children, we anticipate that settings such as childcare programs like Head Start and other support programs like WIC will be critical partners in helping disseminate messaging on the vaccine, given their roles as trusted messengers to families. They can also help link children to vaccine providers, which many already do for routine childhood vaccines. Next slide, please. One reason we anticipate most children will be vaccinated by their regular healthcare providers is that this is where children typically receive other vaccines. As an example, for the 2020 to 2021 flu season, approximately 80% of children six months through four years old received their flu vaccination in their doctor's office. This is compared to very low percentages of children this age who are vaccinated at a pharmacy. And we know that pediatricians, family practice doctors, and nurses are often the most trusted sources of information for families and can help answer any questions family have regarding the vaccines. And getting COVID-19 vaccines in doctor's offices is optimal since it also enables children to receive routine childhood vaccines, screenings for a variety of issues, including developmental and vision screening, and families and children to get counseling on a variety of topics, such as nutrition and injury prevention that help children thrive in a safe environment. Next slide, please. Here we wanted to show some of the resources available for parents and caregivers. We have updated various web pages, including an FAQ page and the six things to know about COVID-19 vaccination for children page. These pages discuss some common questions from parents, including is COVID-19 vaccination for children safe? We also posted a page aimed at parents on vaccinating children with disabilities. In addition, we have fact sheets available in a variety of languages. These and other resources are available at the link at the bottom of the slide. Next slide, please. And finally, parents and caregivers can enroll children in the Be Safe After Vaccination Health Checker, which provides personalized and confidential health check-ins after COVID-19 vaccination. Be Safe is accessible to all COVID-19 vaccine recipients, uses text messages, and is available in multiple languages. Parents can register at vsafe.cdc.gov. Next slide, please. So once again, COVID-19 can cause severe disease and death among children, and COVID-19 vaccination is a critical opportunity to prevent severe illness and death. Thank you for the opportunity to present. Thank you, Dr. Chatham Stevens. The resources shared by Dr. Chatham Stevens have been placed in the chat box for your convenience. Next, we'll move on to our next presenter, Dr. Marshallin Yergin Alsa a developmental pediatrician and senior medical officer at CDC, where she currently leads the COVID disability team. Dr. Jurgen Elsa will address COVID-19 and children with disabilities. Dr. Jurgen Elsa. Hello, everyone. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak about protecting our children and youth from COVID-19, impact and implications for children and youth with developmental disabilities. I'm speaking to you from the perspective of a developmental pediatrician, but also as a mother, grandmother, auntie, cousin, girlfriend, and a member of a community that has been disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Next slide. This is not news. This table shows the risk of COVID-19 cases, hospitalizations, and deaths by race and ethnicity. The comparison is other races and ethnicities to whites. As you see, the risk in the Asian population is low, lower than for whites, but the risk for COVID-19 in American Indian or Alaska Native, Black or African American, and Hispanic or Latino individuals is high in all these groups, with the risk of hospitalizations and deaths being two to three times higher. Next slide. What about our children? These graphs are for cases, and we know that the number of cases reported is an undercount. For children birth to four years of age, the percentage of cases for Hispanic, American Indian, Alaska Native, Black, and multiple race children is higher than their various percentages in the U.S. population. The same is true for the number of COVID-19 cases 
in children five to 11 years old, with perhaps the exception of black children, but the lines are very close. Next slide. Here we're looking at the percentage of children with developmental disabilities by race and ethnicity. 4.3% of children were white and 4.3% of children were Hispanic. However, 5.1% were black children and 5.9% were American Indian Alaska Native. Therefore, we see that the prevalence was higher for black and American Indian Alaska Native children. Next slide. You may wonder why children with disabilities may be more likely to get COVID-19. There are several reasons. First of all, because of the need to be in close contact with others who may have COVID-19. For example, a family member or caregiver may be sick. Other reasons include that it may be hard for a child to understand information about how to stay safe from COVID-19, such as wearing a mask and socially distancing. And it may also be hard for the child to explain when he or she feels sick. Next slide. As we heard, COVID-19 vaccine is safe and effective. For children with disabilities, getting vaccinated can be challenging. However, we have some tips to provide vaccination in ways that are easier for children with developmental disabilities. Some options include being vaccinated in their parent or caregiver's vehicle or quiet areas. Longer appointments for children who may need more time. And sensory modifications during vaccination appointments. Trusted care providers can work with parents to learn and address specific concerns with vaccination. Next slide. We also know that COVID-19 has impacted all of us in many ways. This slide shows ways that parents can help their children cope with being in the COVID-19 environment we now live in. You can strengthen relationships by spending outside time together and getting active. Help with routines by creating a chart or calendar and include family nights in your routine. Help manage stress and anxiety by practicing deep breathing and other techniques to help with relaxation. A vision or dream board can be helpful to think about goals for the future. Next slide. In addition to helping parents and caregivers understand these challenges, the COVID-19 Parental Resources Kit also includes recommendations and resources to help parents, children, adolescents, and young adults during the pandemic. Next slide. Additional CDC resources are included on this slide. Next slide. I encourage all of you to go on the CDC website and visit the many different resources we have on children and COVID-19. I think parents will find a lot of helpful information on our website. Next slide. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you today and for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Yergin Elsa. To learn more about our panel speakers or to access the resources shared in today's presentations, visit www.cdc.gov forward slash protect dash children under the resources section. Now let us ask our presenters a few questions that we have received. As a reminder, submit your questions using the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to respond to as many questions as time allows. We will also post answers to questions not answered during today's webinar on the webinar webpage. Please check this box. Please check this page regularly over the coming weeks. A link to the webinar webpage is now in the chat box. First question is for you, Dr. Chatham-Stevens. 
why is it important for children to get a COVID-19 vaccine? So just like adults, children and teens can get very sick from COVID, have both short and long-term health problems, and can also spread COVID to others. And as I mentioned before, unfortunately, there's no way to tell in advance how COVID will affect certain children. And although children with underlying medical conditions are more likely to become severely ill from COVID, even healthy children without underlying medical conditions can have severe illness. And after getting COVID, children can experience a wide range of ongoing health problems, also known as long COVID, that can include both physical and mental health complications that can affect their quality of life. So once again, vaccinating children six months of age and older provides the best defense against serious outcomes related to COVID-19. Thank you for that response, sir. Now, Dr. Yergin Alsa, let's follow up with why have different races and ethnicities been disproportionately affected by COVID-19? Thank you for that question. The question, the answer to the question involves understanding the social determinants of health. And what do we mean by the social determinants of health? Those are the conditions in the environments where people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affect a wide range of health, functioning, and quality of life outcomes and risk. Racial disparities in health existed before the pandemic. The pandemic just exposed these disparities. Racial and ethnic minorities have more underlying health conditions, less access to quality health care, live in more crowded conditions, are more on the front lines as essential workers, have less access to nutritious foods, and in general, have more opportunities for exposure to COVID-19 and less opportunities for prevention, mitigation, and treatment. Thank you for that response. Dr. Cham Stevens, I have one for you. Are these vaccines safe for children? Yes, the COVID-19 vaccines are safe. Um, these vaccines are being monitored under the most comprehensive and intense vaccine safety monitoring program in US history. And hundreds of millions of children, teens, and adults have already received a COVID-19 vaccine. In addition, before recommending the vaccines to children, scientists conducted clinical trials with thousands of children to make sure that the vaccines are safe and effective. In terms of side effects, some of the reported side effects tend to be mild, temporary, and similar to other side effects experienced after routine vaccination. And some children have no side effects at all. Some of the serious health events after COVID-19 vaccination in children are fortunately rare, and when they are reported, occur most frequently with, within a few days after vaccination. So just to keep in mind, children cannot get COVID-19 from getting vaccinated. COVID-19 vaccines don't alter DNA in any way, and there's no evidence that COVID-19 vaccines cause any problems with fertility or becoming pregnant in the future. So the known risks of getting COVID and the possible severe complications, such as long-term health problems, hospitalization, and even death, outweigh the potential risks of having a rare, serious reaction to vaccination. Thank you so much. Dr. Jurgen Alsop, are people from racial and ethnic minority groups dying from COVID-19 at younger ages? Yes, studies have shown, unfortunately, people from racial and ethnic minority groups are dying from COVID-19 at younger ages. In addition to the social determinants of health, which I mentioned previously, they're often younger when they develop chronic medical conditions, such as asthma, obesity, sickle cell disease, and diabetes. And they're also more likely to have more than one medical condition. Thank you for that. I think I have time for one more question. Dr. Chatham Stevens, I'll have one for you. Can children get the COVID-19 vaccine at the same time as they get other vaccines? Yes, children can get a COVID-19 vaccine and other uh, vaccines, including a flu vaccine at the same time. We know that some children have fallen behind on their routine childhood vaccines during the COVID-19 pandemic. So we're really trying to encourage pediatricians and families to work together to make sure children get their COVID-19 vaccines and get caught up on their routine vaccines, especially ahead of the back to school season. Thank you, perfect timing with kids going back to school. 
Thank you, Dr. Chatham Stevens and Dr. Jurgen Alsop for sharing such great information. Ms. Moore, back to you. Thank you, Captain Johnson. And that was great information. We're also at a point to please turn on your computer, cell phone, or other device. Be ready for our poll question number two. In relation to this webinar, what role best describes you? We have 30 seconds for collecting all our answers. Make sure you scroll down using the bar at the right uh, to capture any extra areas that you might to want to include under other. We have caregivers, parents, siblings, spouse, partner, teen, youth, young adult, and other. And let's look. We have 19% of the audience representing caregivers, 39% parents, 9% identifying as siblings, 16% spouses or partner. Don't have any teen or youth, so we'll make sure to reach out differently next time. And 11% identifying as young adult and 46% of you identifying as other. So with that, we're going to move to the uh, next slide. And our, our next panel will be moderated by Ms. Shayla Anderson, who's a senior pol public health advisor in the Office of Behavioral Health Equity at the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Thank you, Ms. Moore. In this next panel, you will learn information, available resources, and strategies from leaders of community-based organizations who are working daily to protect children and youth living in communities disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. To learn more about our speakers today, please visit www.cdc.gov slash protect children. Now let's meet our speakers for today's community panel. First up, we have Julissa Soto, who is the founder and executive director of Casa Inmigrante and a vaccine champion in the state of Colorado. Hello, everyone. Next, we'll have Captain Holly Van Lu, who is currently Deputy Lead of the Indian Health Services COVID-19 Vaccine Task Force. Followed by Dr. Amy Hatcher, who serves as medical director for the Valley Native Primary Care Center and several rural community health centers operated by South Central Foundation. Next, we have Ms. Beverly Watts Davis, who is chief officer for resource development and program support and senior vice president for Texas West Care Foundation at the Ella Austin Community Center, which operates in 18 states and three US territories to improve behavioral health and empower community residents. Next, we have Mr. Vatana Pung, Executive Director of the Cambodian Family Community Center that provides preventative health and other services to low-income children, immigrants, and refugees in California. So with that, Let's begin our first presentation in the order of introduction. Julissa Soto, I'll now turn it over to you. Hello everyone and thanks for the invite. Um, next slide, please. My name is Julissa Soto and I am an independent health equity consultant in the state of Colorado. Colorado Access is a local nonprofit healthcare company that has been caring for the health of Colorado since 1995. Our mission is to partner with communities and empower people through access to quality, equitable, and affordable care. We are a leader in the transformation and transcreation of Colorado healthcare system. By using our leadership and expertise in health plan operations, integrated healthcare delivery, and population health management. Next slide, please. Our culture is inclusive and our staff and contractors are diverse with many people coming from a range of backgrounds. Next slide, please. 
In this picture, you see one of the kids they show up to our vaccine clinic. At the same time, this mariachi little boy was helping us to distribute home 19 COVID tests and masks. This little boy will tell our story. Now this is the story and how we can protect our children from COVID-19. Next slide. It is important for the vaccine provider to represent the children and youth they are serving. When giving the opportunity, you should consider choosing a provider that looks like the children they are serving. Studies show that when choosing a provider that looks like you, people are more satisfied with their overall service. When children arrive to the clinic, make sure that you make them feel that they are superheroes. Children consider superheroes their role models and assess their behavior and actions to be right. So if vaccinators are automatically, are, if vaccinators are superheroes, automatically the children will, will assume that they are doing the right thing by getting the vaccine. As you can see, our providers in here are superheroes. We have Superman, Flash, and Wonder Woman. Cultural responsiveness is the ability to recognize and understand the role culture plays in healthcare and adapt to care is strategies and adopt care strategies to care and, and to meet children and family needs. So cultural responsiveness is extremely important. For example, when you see a Latino family coming to the vaccine clinics, the example of you know, we need privacy. The bubble doesn't exist in Latino communities. You might see one children getting vaccinated, but the whole family wanted to watch, see, and support. Meeting the community where they're comfortable receiving care. Building trust with community first. Let's go to them. Build trust and invite the community to come to us. A healthy community is a prepared community. Our communities are not healthy. We are not there yet. Eliminate fear and trust in providers. The same way we don't trust systems and providers, they might feel the same way about us. I have noticed that some providers are uncomfortable vaccinating on weekends, nights, or uncomfortable with the population they serve. This is real, bias exists. Make sure that providers understand that they will be in the hood, in the barrios, and not in Hollywood. The providers need to be a person of the people and willing to be one of them, not above them with the ability and passion to serve and lead. Next slide, please. Data informed, we understand the limitations of data. Since the collected data is only a snapshot of the reality, decisions making shouldn't be, shouldn't rely solely on the data. Working with community leaders, cultural brokers is important. A good leader have the integrity, the community trusts you. Community need to know that you say what you believe and act accordingly. Eligible but not enrolled. We're talking about Medicaid culture relevant approaches. Working with mixed status families and new Americans is extremely important. As important of having evening and weekends clinics, we must have evening and weekend clinics. The status quo need to go Monday through Friday, 10 to two, nine to two is not working for our working families or working families can miss work. That will develop trust and that will, we would approach them without respect and cultural, we will be sensitive to their needs. Faith-based outreach also is extremely important. In Colorado, more than 50% Latinos are Catholics. The faith community has the opportunity to provide a moral frame for seeking solutions to important issues such as vaccine. One of my colleagues will speak more on this approach, language justice. When we refer to language justice, we mean the right. Everyone has to communicate in the language and we, we feel most comfortable. Next slide. Community center efforts. Okay, and here I'm telling the children, give me five. As you can see, we're having fun. The children, you will approach the children, the children will approach you. Let's all unite and transform community through vaccines. Give me five guys, I did it. Thank you, Julissa. I'll now turn it over to Captain Holly Van Lu. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today and for allowing us to be part of this exciting opportunity uh, to speak to you. I am Captain Holly Van Lu. I'm a pharmacist. I work within the Indian Health Service. I'm an avid vaccine advocate. I'm a vaccinator. I'm a mother of two adolescent girls. I'm a wife and a daughter of two elder parents who live with me. 
I'm so excited to tell you a little bit about IHS and some of the approaches to COVID-19 vaccine. Oh, next slide, please. Overall, the Indian Health Service, we are a department within the health, Department of Health and Human Services, and we are a comprehensive healthcare delivery system. We are used to providing vaccine in the primary care, urgent care, and other um, situations very frequently. This is our charge. We have a service population of about 2.6 million people. Both that would be anyone who may show up for services and be eligible as part of a federally recognized tribe. And we have federally operated sites, tribal health programs, and urban Indian organizations that we fulfill COVID-19 vaccines for across 37 different states. Our facility and locations, they vary from very remote and rural populations all the way to urban populations. We even have one site at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. So we have a lot of diversity. Next slide, please. The IHS stood up a COVID vaccine task force when we were offered the opportunity to receive and distribute a specialty supply of COVID-19 vaccines. We have tribal and urban facilities, over 356 sites that have been able to receive vaccines through the Indian Health Service. We have delivered nearly 3.2 million and administered over 2.2 million doses to individuals of all ages. Um, and we have been able to provide vaccines to our community members as well. Maybe those individuals who live and work in our communities and may not be eligible uh, for care for the Indian Health Service, typically as a patient, as a member of a federally recognized tribe. We know vaccines are widely available across Indian country, both COVID-19 vaccines and routine immunizations. And we are offering vaccines to everyone six months and older. And we're vaccinating ind individuals for their primary series, their booster doses, or additional, so, so additional doses. Our tribes, and especially our tribal leaders, have been the strongest partners. We have engaged our tribal leaders, used them as trusted messengers, and we are very um, thankful for having the opportunity to amplify the messages of vaccination throughout our communities. This also is important that we've been able to partner with some critical groups, including the CDC, the National Guard, FEMA, the Bureau of Indian Education, and other groups to ensure that we are reaching all levels of patients who may be eligible for vaccination. Next slide, please. We, as already discussed earlier today, um, there are disproportionate effects of that for um, COVID-19 disease, especially in the American Indian Alaskan Native population. As you can see here, cases, hospitalizations, and death rates are higher among American Indian Alaska Natives at nearly all ages, and their rates of death are much higher even in lower um, aged individuals or younger individuals. These findings have certainly highlighted the need for comprehensive and culturally appropriate messaging accessible to American Indian Alaska Native people. We've used those trusted messengers, including tribal healers, native language speakers, our community health representatives, and our community age so that we can meet people where they are, not necessarily just in a medical facility. Also, the messages of cultural preservation, including protection of our elders, and our focus on community has really resonated within the Indian Health Service. Next slide, please. There have been disproportionate effects evident in the children aged zero to four with the elevated hospitalization rates as well. This has been the case you can see in the purple line highlighted here uh, for a significant proportion of the month, uh, American Indian Alaska Native children have been disproportionately affected by hospitalization. Next slide, please. So what are our implementation strategies? How do we get vaccine to where it needs to be in the arm of our um, treasured patients? Well, we use uh, our primary care, our healthcare delivery system, to uh, vaccinate children in well child visits or pediatric or family practice visits. Uh, we also have a lot of um, specialist providers that provide um, behavioral health interventions. We may have individuals in the urgent care or emergency room providing vaccines. Now, if someone were to twist their ankle, we certainly can still give a vaccine that day. So we attempt to use vaccine or every visit as an opportunity for vaccination. 
We also partner our pandemic or seasonal vaccines with our routine immunization efforts as well. And right now is a great time with back to school, a lot of families, kids coming in for sports, physicals, well child checks and Head Start um, evaluations. We've expanded our clinics to include nurses and pharmacists, and we even use our novel pharmacy technician vaccine for administration in children over three. And more importantly, we meet people where they are, which means going to the schools, going out to the Bureau of Indian Education facilities, um, coordinating with our public health nurses, community centers, and attending cultural events. Specifically, we expand a lot of our clinics uh, on weekends and after school hours to accommodate family needs. Typically, if a family comes in and needs some support, we definitely have the opportunity uh, to vaccinate everyone in the family. Next slide, please. We just wanna highlight there are multiple resources available that are culturally appropriate for American Indian Alaska Native communities. We have the IHS vaccine website that has a number of different customizable flyers. We also have the We Can Do This national campaign. Next slide, please. Thank you so much for the opportunity today. Thank you, Captain Van Lu. Next, we have Dr. Amy Hatcher. Hi there, Amy Hatcher here. I am a pediatrician as well as a mom to two incredible boys, ages six and nine. And I'm also medical director for the Valley Native Primary Care Clinic in Wasilla, Alaska. So it's still morning here for me. Uh, next slide, please. So South Central Foundation is an Alaska Native owned, clinically vertically integrated healthcare system. We are really customer focused and see ourselves more as a service industry. We um, have operational principles that guide us in our decision-making and our strategic planning. And as you can see, they're all related to relationships. Our vision speaks toward multidimensional wellness, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual wellness. And our mission speaks toward um, involving the community and really working with the native community. Next slide, please. So this shows is a map that shows the, the area that we serve. We serve 65,000 customer owners or patients and the geographical region is approximately 126,000 square miles, which is roughly the size of Colorado. You can see the stars on the map are also where we have clinics that we operate. Next slide, please. So this slide shows some of our community health centers. We operate 13 in total, and all but one of these on the slide here are accessible by small aircraft only. So um, as mentioned earlier, we definitely have some very remote locations that we serve. Next slide, please. So the NUCA system of care is what we call our care delivery system. And instead of focusing on just the needs of the individual patient or customer owner, we put a lot of emphasis on the community and treating them in the context of their family and their community. We have incredible integrated care teams that um, you can see on the slide here have various um, professionals and they're all located in the same family medicine space, clinical space. Next slide, please. So when COVID hit, we were fortunate enough to have the NUCA system of care as our, as our sort of background and our, um, our, our background. So we were able to kind of quickly pivot to make some adjustments. And we started with lots and lots of meetings with tribal leaders, city, state planning. We um, got creative with things called things like a respiratory clinic. We got super creative with virtual care. We were doing a lot of this before COVID, but really, really ramped it up when COVID hit. Got super creative with parking lots. So we were doing vaccines and COVID testing flu shots out of trailers, out of parking lots. Did lots of mail out medications, ports drop offs, um, lots of things that you can see here on the slide. Next slide. We put a lot of emphasis on communication. Communication, not only with our staff, but also with our customer owners and patients and community. We did four Anchorage Native News special editions. Um, our president and CEO has been very intentional during this time to communicate with staff, as well as the people that we serve. She's been doing weekly emails with lots of data, transparent information. Um, our executive leadership has been been doing like Zoom chats with our staff and we are um, 
able to ask questions and get answers from her. Next slide. Here you can see some of our PR materials. We have lots of it, but I just chose a few to show with you today. Um, so this is Anchorage Native News, what everyone should know about COVID-19. Here's a couple of our Facebook posts really geared toward uh, pregnancy and childhood vaccine. The bottom photo shows um, something that you may see if you walk into one of our lobbies. It says, keep cultures thriving, get a COVID vaccine, keep heritage strong, vaccinate your children. Next slide. This is one of our more recent photos. Uh, I really love this one. It says, don't leave COVID-19 into our culture. And this is for, um, just recently came out for the approval for ages six months and up. Next slide. This is just a screenshot from our website, southcentralfoundation.com. Lots of good information if you wanna learn more about us, but also I just wanted to point out that we have uh, links to various CDC information. This self-checker is something for staff to be able to go and check and see if they need to quarantine or what they need to do if they test positive. Um, so lots of great information there. Next slide. Lastly, I just wanted to add with uh, end with a little bit of data. So this is some of our vaccine information from some of our really rural sites that I mentioned. And you can see there's a wide range of um, vaccination rates, but um, some of these communities, Kakanak, for example, or St. Paul, you can see for the first and second doses are close to 100% of the community are vaccinated, which is absolutely incredible considering how small these communities are and how remote they are. Um, next slide. This here shows um, the, so this is one of our supervisors and managers receiving the first shipment of COVID vaccine out in one of those rural communities. And here's one of our community health aides getting vaccinated. And it's just incredible to see how these communities have come together to really, really advocate for um, vaccination for everybody. Next slide. I think with that, I am all done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hatcher. We'll now hear from Ms. Beverly Watts Davis. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to, in fact, be here with you. I just want to tell you I'm with the West Care Foundation, and we were founded in 1973, and we're a health and human service provider. We're in 19 states, 13 territories. We serve approximately 60,000 people annually, and we employ approximately 1,600 people. But I want to move to the next slide, which is really what we're here today for. So we want to just talk about really some community-based strategies. And I, want to, and I want to just emphasize that these are our best practices that we have seen um, being really effective across our states, but also in San Antonio, Texas, where we have a number of, of different, um, number of different prog programs going on uh, with vaccinations. But first of all, I want to just be able to say it is really important to be able to engage and enlist what's called credible messengers. And these are people who your, commu who, community, who your community is actually going to listen to. Oftentimes we uh, assume that just because we exist that, that we will open and they will come, but they're not, no, not, in today's world, people are not necessarily going to come unless they actually believe in you. And I think that's incredibly important for us to remember that, that the credible messengers in the communities are in fact the community members themselves. And in fact, I wanna just simply say that in terms of, of doing this, and we have, we employed a strategy, and I'm just literally jumping now to bullet three. We, we worked with AmeriCorps members, community health workers, student interns, and neighborhood networkers. These people were very, very instrumental in actually getting out, putting boots on the ground, and actually walking in communities, going door to door, talking with people. This actually began to open, have people opening their doors going, well, this is something really important in our community. If we've got people doing this, if they're willing to walk the blocks, and let us know about what's going on. This was very, very important to actually helping us to get people vaccinated and then getting their children vaccinated. We did uh, an, an another strategy we utilized is we we actually in turn we worked for faith based organizations, but we didn't go to them and ask them, "Will you please do one more thing that somebody is asking you to do?" We we really kind of came in from a different way. We were already building capacity in faith based organizations to understand mental health. And we were training on mental health first aid and helping to build mental health ministries in the churches. So because we had formed a relationship with them in terms of building their capacity to address family issues more, 
they were much more willing to listen to us in terms of actually be, beginning to, to focus in on vaccinations, especially when it came to our most precious treasures, uh, our children. And so by be, because we had built capacity with them, this was another strategy we added to them. So the churches got involved with really stepping up to do vaccinations, both for, for senior citizens and for children. And that was really, really very important. In addition, it's really important to realize that none of us are successful by ourselves. We really believe in, in what's called problem solving um, coalitions. And this is, this is where you're literally coming together and you, you forget about who gets the credit and we focus in on the goal. This coal, the, right now we, are, we have a coalition that's with the University of Texas Health Science Center. And that is really about engaging people to actually get vaccinations, particularly pediatric vac vaccinations and senior citizen vaccinations. We, we, we have a, an alliance, if, if you'll look at the screen in the, in the bottom right corner, you will see, that's one of our coalition meetings. You will see, you will see it, you can't tell except for with the police department. We're sitting there with our police department, our fire department, our, our community health workers, our health department, our schools, sitting around the table, figuring out what is the best way to be able to make sure that we're getting everybody vaccinated. We're working with our Spurs, our national basketball team, National Basketball Association team, in which we're gonna be doing a backpack drive. And at that backpack drive, for all those children who are coming into the arena, we're going to be also vaccinating them. And so again, these are, these are not normally the partners that most people would partner with. You wouldn't think about them in terms of doing a health initiative, but in fact, they are the ones who, who actually make a difference in terms of getting to, to community members who would not necessarily come forward. Something that people have, uh, other people have constantly talked about through this presentation is to creating vaccination sites that are accessible and available. And I really wanna give my hats off to all my fellow panelists who continue to emphasize this. We have to meet people where they are. And I have been so pleased with our business. This was part of one of our involving people in our coalition, our business communities, who are willing to offer pizza sales and, and, and an extra McDonald's coffee or a, a McDonald's McMuffin or whatever that, that comes with getting vaccinated. That, that, that's when you really have your community all in and everybody doing a part of what they can do to really help raise the message about the importance of pediatric vaccinations and vaccinations, period. I want to be able to say messaging can't be just a, we're going to do a, a, a media campaign and we run it for two or three weeks and think that that's all we have to do. Messaging has to be everywhere all the time. Let me repeat that. Messaging has to be everywhere all the time because we want this to be getting your children vaccinated has to be a part of the community culture. It has to become a community norm. It is how we operate. It is how we it's, it's what we do uh, in, in our community. We have a, an African proverb that, that many of you all will be, are familiar with, and it is, it takes a village to raise a child. That's absolutely true, but it also takes a village to save a child and to save our children. We all must come together and employ that village strategy so that we, as the village in our communities, are making sure that our children are vaccinated. It is for our future. It is for their health. It is to save them. And that is our responsibility. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you, Ms. Davis. I'll now turn it over to Vatana Pang. Tumripsu uh, and good morning, everyone from Orange County, California. My name is Vatana Pung, Executive Director of the Cambodian Family Community Center. Uh, my pronoun is he, him, his. Uh, thank you so much for allowing me to be in this community space with you all. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I would like to start by sharing uh, with you about my organization, uh, Cambodian Family Community Center which is a community-based nonprofit organization founded in 1980 by a group of Cambodian refugees. As you can see photos on your left, uh, those were our refugee children that were served in the 80s. Uh, Orange County is the sixth most populous county in the United States uh, with over 3.2 million residents and of which over 24%, about 780,000 people are identified as Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders or AA and HPI. 
Uh, TCF has served the community for over 42 years and has provided culturally and linguistically tailored program and services. Uh, each year, uh, we reach uh, over 30,000 community members and serve over 3,000 clients. Uh, over 95% of our clients are low income uh, and limited English proficient um, uh, uh, members. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm so excited to share with you all the collective effort that the Cameroon family and our community partners have done together to increase children vaccination. Uh, we know that this work cannot be done alone and cannot be done in silo. Uh, we have closely worked with over 25 partners, including the OC API Task Force, County Health Department, MACA, Ocapica, Temples, Churches, a small business owner and more to provide culturally and linguistically responsive outreach, education, navigation, uh, facilitation, referrals and linkages to vaccine appointment and case management, and also dis the dissemination of the COVID-19 uh, information and resources. Um, we reach out community members and over 20 different languages. And we have used culturally and linguistically responsive outreach and education, such as door-to-door -door and community canvassing, a cultural events such as the Cambodian New Year, TAT festival, social media, after-school youth program, uh, co-location of services, and more. Uh, I just want to share you uh, with you a, a story. Uh, we had a mother of two children, two years old and five years old. Uh, she came to our center for assistance with applying for food stamp and Medicaid. Uh, because of this service, our health navigator was able to inform her about the importance of getting her children vaccinated. Uh, she had a lot of concerns, and one of which, which is the uh, side effects which she was scared that her children could not take it and she could not take time off from work to take care of her children if they get sick. Also, her primary care provider has never mentioned anything about getting her children vaccinated. However, after a week or so of uh, providing her with education and support in Khmer language, in her own language, uh, she talked to her husband and she had decided to have both her two years old and five years old children vaccinated. I am so pleased that both of her children are now vaccinated and they all were very happy. Uh, the mom came back to us and thanked us for helping her navigate through the process and addressing her concern. This is a very important lesson learned that the entry point to getting children vaccinated also come from co-location of social and health services. Uh, using the California Department of Public Health vaccination data rate, we have also employed zip code based strategy where we go out to the zip codes that have the lowest vaccination rate. We have also partnered with small business owner and food trucks to increase vaccination among children and youth. Uh, for example, at our yesterday vaccination clinic, we were able to get a Vietnamese food truck to come out and provide free food to, to children and their families who get vaccinated. Uh, achieving vaccine equity is not just about getting people vaccinated. Uh, the Cambodian family and our partners are also addressing the social determinants of health by supporting children and their family with their basic and immediate needs, such as rental assistance, uh, internet access, uh, mental health counseling services, public uh, enrollment, and public charge education. Next slide, please. I would like to share with you some of the process outcome of our collective effort to support children vaccination. As you can see photo on the left, we have a taco truck coming, a food truck coming out to provide food to our vaccinated children and family. Uh, we have reached over 200,000 people and have over 9,900 limited English proficient uh, community member and children access COVID-19 vaccine and booster. So parents, caregiver, you are not alone. Next slide, please. As you can see in this photo, we conducted door-to-door -door canvassing, talked to the street vendor, laundromat client, donut store owner, and many more. Next slide, please. And that has uh, concluded my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Batana. Thanks to each of our community's superhero presenters, such powerful stories and work that you're doing to protect our children and youth from COVID-19.
I'm sure that everyone in attendance today received a lot of great information that you can take back to your communities and share with your own families. I would now like to ask all of our pre presenters a few questions that we have received. As a reminder, you can submit your questions using the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. We will do our very best to respond to as many questions as time allows. We will also post answers to questions not answered during today's webinar on the webinar page, web page. Please check this page regularly over the coming week. A link to the webinar page is now being placed in the chat box. So to our panelists, first to Hulisa, what are some of the biggest challenges in providing equitable care to the pediatric population? Oh, that's a good question. Public health departments, everyone wants to go back to what was normal to them way back in 2019. The status quo need to go. We must understand that for us to live by that word, the status quo need to go, we have to be the disruptors. We have to be the disruptor and that creates conflict among cultural brokers and public health departments. Let's look at the message. What's wrong? Why is it that our community is vaccinated at less than 50% in Colorado? I don't know in your states, but based on the statistics that you guys shown, we're, the, we're not doing great in many, many states. So let's look at the message and don't kill the messenger. Don't go after the messenger. Be grateful to the messenger that they have the guts to say exactly what it is happening in the community. It, like I say again, the status quo need to go. We must disrupt systems. Systems in the first place were made for the Anglo community. That These systems don't work. I don't know if we need to work on the systems or recreate systems, but we must need to, we need to do something about it. And, and we keep saying the status quo need to go. Most of us need to live by this word. What does it mean, the status quo need to go? And are you willing to put the work? Are you willing to put your blood out there because leading is bleeding, my friends. So yes, my biggest challenge is, is that everyone wants to go back to normal. They want to do what they were doing in 2019. That has to go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hulisa. Captain Van Lu, are there any examples of specific techniques that worked well to increase vaccination rates in children within the Indian Health Service? Thanks for that question. I would say, as uh, Julia mentioned, we need to do something different. And we have been able to do that with COVID-19. We found some really unique strategies that worked well. That's going into the community, being there at cultural centers. And specifically, there was one situation in the Navajo area where we have phenomenal teen vaccination rates. And when we asked more questions about how that was able to happen, how, how Navajo made that difference, Part of it was meeting the, the community where they are. They are huge basketball fans. And so many vaccines were administered at sporting events where there's a lot of child and adolescent individuals. So it's really exciting to see um, terrific opportunities taken in the community and at cultural community <laughs> sporting events and doing things outside of uh, the typical uh, standard of care, which is just presenting to a, a physician's office. Thank you. Dr. Hatcher, are there any changes you made at the beginning of the pandemic that are still in place and you, that you think will last into the future? Yeah, um, I love I love this question. So um, the status quo has to go, I think, is, is the theme here. Um, we kind of I mentioned earlier, we got creative with parking lot um, stuff. So doing testing and vaccinations, meeting folks in their cars. Um, drive up pharmacy has been a huge hit and our customer owners have been really uh, appreciative of that. So I think our intention is to continue that, especially in the Alaskan winters, it's super cold. People don't want to come in. Um, doing, doing more with our home visit team, we have providers and nurses that go into the homes and can bring vaccines to the homes and bring medications to the homes um, and virtual care. So we, we did a lot of virtual care before, but we're doing way more now, especially for our behavioral health um, visits. And it's so much easier for someone to take a 15 minute break to talk to their therapist than to take a half a day off work to come in. So virtual care and really just sort of meeting people where they are, that's the common theme I'm hearing here, which I think is really 
important. So thank you for that question. Absolutely, thanks. And it is great to meet people exactly where they are. So with that, Ms. Watts Davis, what strategies did you use to engage the faith community in supporting the COVID-19 childhood vaccination efforts? Well, again, it, as I said, we, we really began to, to have a relationship. We began through relationships already existing with their churches. And that's going to be really important. Figure out things that you can actually do with your faith-based community, as opposed to just always going to them when you want something from them. That's true with any partner. No one wants to just always be feel like they're just being used just because you've now thought about them when you weren't thinking about them before. Establish those, establish those contacts now so that, again, our faith communities are still a big influence, particularly in the Afro-American community. They are still hold a lot of influence. And people, when I talked about credible messengers, again, that are many of your pastors, many of your community leaders, your neighborhood association leaders, Leaders who are on the ground, as I say, continue to have boots on the ground, who people who people in your in, in the community actually know and trust. And that's really, really very important. Many, much of the faith based community is that and involving them in being able to make that difference um, was really very, very important because we already had a relationship with them. But getting them to expand the activities that they were doing in the community to make a difference. Thank you. So Vatana, over to you. What is your organization's intergenerational approach to promoting COVID-19 vaccines for children? Thank you for the question. Um, our Asian American, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community is so diverse. Within the, our community, we have over 35 subgroups. So imagine that you have to tailor those outreach and education to different groups. So the outreach and education strategy do not look the same in each community. Uh, for example, the Cameroon community that we work with, the majorities are immigrants and limited English proficient, and they work in restaurants and donut stores to provide for their family. So most of the time, the children are taken care of by their grandparents. So when we conduct um, outreach and education to increase children vaccination, we include grandparents as a part of our target groups. Uh, also in our culture, uh, father uh, view as the head of the household and play a significant role in making a lot of family decisions, including health for the family, including children health as well. Uh, that's why we also included father as our target participant for outreach education. So we include the different part. We want to make sure that all the families are on board when we talk about children uh, vaccination. Uh, as I mentioned earlier about a story of a mother, she had to go back to her husband. Can I get my children vaccinated, right? If the children, if the husband said no, uh, the children probably would not have the opportunity to get uh, vaccinated. So how do we get talking to, to the father as well, right? Because usually the father is the head of the household. How, how do we include that? Uh, father as part of the decision-making process and also education targeted group as well. Thank you. Absolutely. Understanding the family dynamic is, is key. So Hulisa, back to you. Tell us what culturally sensitive strategies do you use to reach Black, Indigenous, people of color or BIPOC communities? What cultural strategies I like Mrs. Watts was saying and Mrs. Davis, uh, reaching out to the Catholic churches. 50% of Latinos in Colorado are Catholics. So we must approach the archdiocese and, and everyone who's working here. That's one thing that we all agree on is getting to the churches, getting where the people is at and vaccinating them with their own cultural values. So the strategies I have used is from going and knocking doors to doors also, walking with El Paletero, which is, means the ice cream man, and, and making sure that everybody hears that the ice cream man is here, but also that we have a COVID-19 vaccine clinic coming up soon. So we have to understand what the community is thinking, right? The, those first arrivals, new Americans, mixed status families, what are their fears? Why is it that we professionals want us and people to come to us, have a table and wait for them to come to us? And if they don't come to us, then we're like, well, we're here. We're serving everyone. We're cultural competent. We're cultural aware. That's not necessarily true. 
The cultural approach is to meet the community where they're at, respect their culture, understand their culture. So if I don't understand an Asian community and the African-American community, I will go to a cultural broker that looks like those families and then get into those communities. You know, who do we think we are just because we're professionals, providers to go to communities and say, well, we're here, we did our best. This is cultural relevant approach. This is diversity, equity and inclusion, which everyone loves those words and no one lives by it. So, you know, those are the cultural approaches that I had had with my community. I go knock on people's doors, introduce myself. I don't say my big degrees, titles, nothing like that. I'm just Julissa from the block trying to save your life. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, so Vatan, I'm going to punt back to you. Um, what is one key lesson learned um, that you have obtained from your local collaborative work in promoting vaccinations for children? Thank you. Um, uh, like I mentioned earlier, one of the biggest lesson learns that we have had uh, we have received through our partnership and the work in the community is that the entry point to getting children vaccinated and also other community members, especially LEP community members, also come from co location of social and health services. People would not come to you, I want to get vaccinated, not that really, but they would come for, I want to apply for food stamp, I would like to uh, apply for Medicaid, I would like to um, get uh, some uh, immigration paperwork done. And using that like location of services and talk about the importance of getting their, themselves and their children vaccinated is very important. So if you are from a community-based organization, search around your area to see what are the social services providers and how you can increase that partnership. And the last thing about partnership with small business owners, especially ethnic minority owned business to how we can work together between the public, the private, the business, and also the community-based organization to increase vaccination. For example, I was able to talk to a food truck owner. Can you bring the food? And then I try to write a couple more grants to support that kind of thing. So this is a true partnership uh, within your area as well. So you can localize it uh, within those uh, strategy within your area and see who is uh, part of the community that want to build a better uh, uh, health and, and, and well-being for the community. Thank you. Thank you again, Vatana, and thank you to all of our panelists, our superhero presenters. You guys are amazing for the work that you're doing, um, and thanks to the audience for those amazing questions. I would now like to turn it back over to Ms. Moore. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. And yes, now are you ready for poll question number three? If so, Please get your computer, cell phone, and other device ready to answer. How did you hear about this webinar? Community organization, government entity, other ways, social media, email, don't forget to scroll down using the right, um, the bar on the right to make sure you see all the choices that we've outlined for you, including other. Really appreciate everyone's quick response to this. Almost there. Just a few seconds left. Okay, it looks like the poll has ended. And so now we can see that we have 24% learning from community-based organizations, 38 from government entities. We see social media was able to attract 1%, 25% from email and 3% from family or friends. And again, we have about 8% coming from other. So we're going to try and find out who other really involves. And with that, we're also thank you for participating in this poll, getting ready to move on to our closing remarks. It will come from Dr. Leandra Sreeberg, Associate Director for Minority Health and Health Equity at the CDC. 
In this capacity, she leads and supports a range of critical functions in the agency's work in minority health, health equity, and women's health. Dr. LaBird, the virtual floor is now yours. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much, um, Ms. Moore. As she said, I am Leandris LaBird, and I get the pleasure and the privilege of working with uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And on behalf of our interagency work group, I'd like to thank and congratulate all of our speakers for the essential work they're doing and accomplishing in communities around the country. You all are indeed superheroes. And I have been so impressed and so inspired by all of the presentations and the questions and just the participation today. We would all agree that protecting our children from severe illness associated with COVID-19 infections is a national priority. Parents, grandparents, caretakers, community-based organizations and institutions that serve children and adolescents, along with others who advocate every day for the health and well-being of all youth take seriously the decision to get our babies, children, and teens vaccinated. We understand and agree that this decision must be based on the best available science and be accessible. Our goal today was to make leading experts available to you to provide credible information and answer your questions. We also wanted you to hear about programs going on around the country to increase vaccination coverage among children of color. We hope you walk away with new ideas and greater vaccine confidence, that your questions were answered and your concerns allayed. Put any remaining questions in the chat and we will do all we can to get an answer for you. Thank you audience for participating in today's webinar. More than 1,100 people joined us today. Wow. I also want to thank all of the operating divisions within the Department of Health and Human Services and their community partners who joined us today. Special thanks go to the webinar planning team. And I want to acknowledge Desiree Robinson, Shona Zolikoffer, Hafsatu Berry, and Sneha Amaresh for their pristine coordination, creativity, and execution of the many levels of decision-making needed to make today possible. Captain Anitra Johnson and Shayla Anderson, thank you for your sustained engagement with all aspects of the planning, from concept to implementation of the webinar. I also extend my heartfelt gratitude to my co-chair of the Interagency Workgroup, Rosalind Moore, for supporting this activity and promoting it across the department and beyond. And a special mention of Dr. Keisha Lindsay for the many months of leadership she provided to planning this webinar and making sure today would be a reality. Many health disparities are largely preventable. And the current disparities in vaccination coverage among children of color and children with disabilities can be prevented. So thank you to everyone for all you do to bring health equity to your community. I will now hand the program back to Ms. Moore. Thank you, Dr. LaBird, for your thoughtful call for action and recognition of all the effort that led to this moment. And now we're moving to our final poll for today. Please get your computer, cell phone, or other device ready to answer. 
please let us know how we did. This webinar helped me to improve my knowledge about the importance of COVID-19 vaccination for children. And so here are some options, strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree. We appreciate all feedback. We learn from it and we'll do better. And where things have gone well, just continue in that direction. We have 30 seconds for this as we are moving towards the end of this session. Really appreciate everybody giving us feedback. See the numbers rolling in. The poll will end shortly. We're winding down. And we're about at a stop. And so we have 40% strongly agreeing that the information was helpful, 45% saying they agree that they've learned a lot about what they need to know, 13% neutral, 2% disagree, and 1% strongly disagree that this is not what they needed, and so we'll do better next time. Moving on, we now know that we are at a point where as Dr. LaBird said, it's time for us to take action, move forward. So thank you for participating in our final poll and for joining us on the Protecting Our Children and Youth from COVID-19 Information for Parents, Caregivers, and Community Partners webinar. Before you leave, please remember to visit the webinar webpage at www.cdc.gov forward slash protect dash children for fact sheets in seven different languages and resources shared from today's webinar. Please check the website regularly for the recording of today's webinar, which will be posted within the next few weeks and a list of answers to questions you asked on today's webinar. For questions or comments about today's webinar, email omhhe at cdc.gov for additional information. And with that, I wish everyone a great weekend and thank you again.